you is about Sir William Osgood. Why does he still matter? Uh, and I chose that for my title because uh, although Osler has been uh, called the saint, this was a cartoon done of him in 1897 at Johns Hopkins. You see him hovering over the Johns Hopkins Hospital with all the hordes of uh, microbes uh, fleeing in the wake of the Osler cyclone. He has been the study subject of at least uh, four full-scale biographies, uh, actually now more than 2,000 articles in the literature, 11 articles of special uh, medical journals, Osler societies that meet regularly, and as Dr. Del Maestro uh, may have indicated to you, I've recently edited uh, nearly 1,000-page encyclopedia about Osler. Uh, Osler was looked at as a saintly person by his contemporaries for reasons that we will see shortly. Uh, the, uh, the glow of his personality is uh, now faded. He died in December uh, 1919, and, and recently people have taken him on, including here at McGill. Uh, he pointed out that he was lukewarm about the idea of women in medicine. All medical students at McGill during his, his time there uh, were uh, white males. You can see them in the photographs. Uh, he has been taken on for an unfortunate uh, comment he made that Canada is for white people, the context which I have written about in response to this uh, comment here. It was an incident that uh, occurred in, in 1914 uh, when most uh, white Canadians felt that way. Uh, recently, uh, Patrick Fittes, who is an, an 80-year-old retired consultant or internist, as we would say, in the United States and Australia, has come out with a book. And his main criticism is about the myth of William Osler. Uh, his beef is not so much with Osler, but rather how much has been made of Osler posthumously. He quotes a letter in the McGill archives uh, to the effect that Osler was quite modest. Osler wrote to a friend in 1915. Uh, this is in your archives at McGill. I do not think I've ever done anything that has not been uh, done uh, by somebody previously often much better. One picks up a brick or two and carries it to the common edifice, but I've only been a hot carrier and do not come into the class with the great architects of the whole building or even with the designers and decorators of the halls and walls. Uh, interestingly, he makes no mention of racism. When I did edited the encyclopedia on Osler, I, I looked as Phoenix did in sort of a parallel track. We've sort of become email buddies, although uh, we have sort of opposite uh, shades of opinion uh, about uh, Osler. And I'm about to re uh, review his book, uh, but uh, uh, he looked at everything he could say negative about Osler, and I, and I did the same and came up with a list of 30 things in the encyclopedia, which I've now expanded to 40. Uh, most of them to the effect that he was indeed a man of his times. Uh, he was not perfect from today's uh, perspective. To tell you a little bit about Osler, since uh, he may be new to some of you, uh, he was uh, born in what was in Upper Canada, uh, above the city of Toronto. He uh, went to the University of Toronto, he went to Trinity College in Toronto for a while and then transferred uh, to McGill, where he got his medical degree, uh, following his medical degree at McGill, where as a student, he was uh, sort of uh, looked at as average by his classmates. Uh, this, to me, is the inspiring thing about him, that he showed that you don't have to be super, super brilliant, uh, like uh, Dr. Del Maestro, to make a name for yourself. You can work very, very hard, and, and you, will, uh, you will get there. His uh, mentor in Montreal encouraged him to learn all he could about all of medicine and surgery rather than to become an ophthalmologist. He was a little bit disappointed. He wanted to become an ophthalmic surgeon, which would enable him the, uh, the spare time to do what he liked. But he went ahead and tried indeed to master all of medicine, wrote a monumental textbook of medicine. Uh, he he uh, went first to Philadelphia uh, following what Canadians call the brain drain, leaving McGill for Philadelphia, and then to Baltimore, to Johns Hopkins, where there was a new medical school that would be built along new lines as an integral part of a university, and with the chiefs of the departments also being the uh, 
corresponding uh, professors at the medical school. Uh, in 1905, uh, he took what we might describe as early retirement to Oxford, uh, where he died. Uh, his times were quite different from ours, as you can see there. Uh, this is Montreal, an upper right, when he graduated from medical school, for example, a far different city. So a lot of people today use the lens of presentism to take him on. In thinking about why does Osler still matter, uh, I thought of the way I try to conceptualize uh, myself as, a, as, a, as a, 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 a series of concentric circles as shown here. Uh, first, in the blue in the middle, I'm a human being, a, a person. Uh, then after that, I'm a physician. Uh, we could uh, build some more uh, circles to say that I'm an, uh, after being a physician, I'm an internist, and then I'm a, uh, an infectious diseases doctor, and then I'm a physician educator. Beyond that, I'm a humanist, and that's, I don't use that as a, as a brag term, but rather to make the point that uh, I'm try to be as best I can a promoter of human flourishing, which I think may be at least my favorite definition of a humanist. Uh, and finally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a presence in creation. I'm a, a part of the, uh, the universe and the great mysteries pertaining uh, thereunto. And so as you look in terms of falling back, uh, as you get older, uh, nearing the end of your life cycle, you sort of fall back and, and, and each of these sort of peels back in turn. So looking at why Osler matters, uh, I came up with, with four tentative answers. One is an exemplar of personal effectiveness, which was the thesis of my first uh, book about Osler. Second, uh, the idea of the medical profession as a calling and a hope for humanity. Uh, third is looking at medicine being in combination with the humanities uh, he titled his last lecture given in May 1919 in Oxford, The Old Humanities and the New Science, thereby sort of reconciling for his generation the perceived tension between the humanities and the sciences. And finally, uh, in thinking about the big questions of our existence, the larger questions of epistemology and uh, metaphysics uh, that sort of escape us all. So with that preamble, I would like to look first at Osler as exemplar of personal effectiveness. Uh, this was a subject of my first book, which you might be able to see here, done by Oxford University Press in 1997. And I looked at Oxford, uh, I mean, looked at Osler in terms of how to be an effective person because he was an amazingly effective person, an effective and efficient uh, person. And, uh, I think became a, what we would call an outlier. Uh, many of you, perhaps most of you are familiar with uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book by that title. And Gladwell, as you may recall, uh, identified certain features of outliers in every field, be they great scientists or great tennis players or the Beatles or Bill Gates, things that made them stand out. Osler in a memorable lecture, uh, entitled uh, An Alabama Student, uh, about an obscure student in uh, a, a physician in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, closed by saying uh, that in 60 years after our deaths, uh, nobody knows anymore who or what we were, quoting Matthew Arnold, uh, uh, then, then he knows uh, about the, the midmost uh, 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 waves in the moonlit solitudes mile that swell for a moment and gone. We'll be forgotten after about 60 years uh, and uh, only a few snatch something from dull oblivion. Well, Osler was one of those from his generation who was remembered, who was able to snatch something from dull ob oblivion. And to me, Osler uh, is sort of emblematic of what might be called the heroic age of medicine. The period between, say, roughly uh, 1880 and 1920, when scientific medicine uh, really got its foundation, setting the course uh, that we now know today. Characteristics of an outlier, according to, to Gladwell, are one, uh, ambition. You, you have to be fired with ambition. Second, to have a favorable family of origin. Uh, third, to have luck along the way and on your side. 
And fourth and finally, work. Gladwell found uh, on the average that outliers put in about 10,000 hours of dedicated work toward their purpose. Osler commented that, that he called work the, the, uh, the master word of medicine, no substitute for hard work. I think first of all, for you young people, you know, I need to decide whether you want to be an outlier or to have a more nearly balanced life. Because unless you're incredibly uh, brilliant, you're going to have to pay the price to be the best at anything. Uh, you need to constrict things in other areas of, of your life in order to focus on uh, being an outlier. Uh, he found this to be the case. For example, the Beatles uh, practiced together for about 10,000 hours in, in Hamburg, Germany, and really got it down as a group before they made their name. Bill Gates, as he was a teenager, was sneaking out of his uh, house at night to go over to the uh, computer laboratory uh, in, in Palo Alto. Uh, so he, so Osler became fired with ambition and decided when he was in uh, Germany uh, for a postgraduate uh, uh, tour after medical school in the presence of the great uh, Rudolf Virchow uh, that he would aspire to be a great generalist physician, quote, of the first rank, end quote, that he would be uh, one of the best. He was blessed with a favorable family of origin. His parents were not rich, but Featherstone and Ellen uh, Picton Osler were probably the most successful parents in, uh, in, if you judge in terms of the success of your offspring. They had nine children. One died in infancy. Uh, Willie was the eighth and, and last of the surviving uh, uh, children. Uh, it, but he had three older brothers who were also su uh, very successful and, and well-known in Canada. He had a lot of uh, luck along the way. Uh, for example, the chairmanship of medicine at Johns Hopkins, which was his big lucky break, was, was offered to Thomas Lauder Brunton of London before it was offered to Osler. Uh, Brunton was the man who introduced nitroglycerin for the treatment of angina pectoris, but he decided to stay in London. And finally, the hard work, Osler put off marriage until he was about 40 years old. He led a semi-monastic life uh, here in Montreal among the medical students and young doctors. Uh, nobody really knows much about his, his romantic life uh, up until that time uh, because he was all about medicine. He really had no social ambition uh, other than being a doctor. Eventually, of course, he becomes knighted. In doing the encyclopedia on Osler, I tabulated data on 205 reminiscences of Osler by his contemporaries. And I used uh, a, a, a look for key words and traits that characterize Osler using uh, the character strength survey of, of uh, called the values in action uh, character strengths developed by members of the American Psychological Association. And what I found was that strengths of vitality and kindness led all the rest. Osler was a magical person to members of his generation. He was like a cheerleader for people doing medicine on both sides of the Atlantic. He had what I like to call a theology of affirmation, affirming others, helping other people feel good about themselves. He made his mark, he wrote papers, but it was more about telling you what a great job you did I think the key thing is to achieve a certain status in life, et cetera, et cetera, that you're able to do that with your peers, but there's no reason that you can't do that now, those of you who are doing work. Compliment your classmates. Compliment those around you. In uh, 1892, he came out with a textbook of medicine, which quickly became the standard around the world, uh, the principles and practice of medicine, so that throughout the English-speaking world, people knew who Osler was. So what he would do, he would uh, keep uh, in his uh, jacket pocket, perhaps, uh, pre-stamp postcards of the sort you can buy at, at the postal office. And when he saw, for example, that Renee or Abby or Rakai or, or Kyla had come out with an article in the literature, he would dash off something and say, great paper, Kyla, please send me a reprint. And if you didn't send him a reprint of your next paper, he would tease you, shame on you, Kyla, you didn't send me a reprint of your paper. He would dash off about 40 of these a day. 
wonderful affirmer, and people said that he was he, he was the 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 wheel around which medicine turned on two continents, meaning uh, Europe and the United States. In my book on Osler, I look at the idea of character. What do we mean by character? Uh, the definitions of character and virtue uh, reciprocate. Uh, a person of character is one who displays a virtue. But I think another way to look at it is shown here is that someone of character is someone who has clear-cut principles. Write down your principles uh, in a little book and keep it to yourself. Don't show them to anybody and do the same with your goals. And people with character tend to have their actions consistent with their goals and their goals consistent with their principles. They act consistently in a way that is uh, benevolent and beneficent and to the good of those around them. Keep your life in balance, uh, have written goals in all the major areas of life. So to me, to summarize the first section, uh, Osler is an exemplar of personal effectiveness. I don't look at him particularly as a personal hero uh, at all. I look at him as, a, as one of my, my role models, but not the perfect role model. But one point of this is to be your own hero and try to absorb the best of those who, uh, that you see around you while also taking their foibles or shortcomings or mistakes that they make uh, as, as sort of warnings for you. Uh, so uh, observe those around you. The second point about Osler is the idea of medicine as a calling. And here we, we have a challenge. What do we mean by called? I once uh, uh, was asked, what do you mean by calling by a, 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 a minister, uh, a woman of the cloth, you might say? And her answer, I tried to fumble around. She said that you're called when your greatest joy meets the world's greatest need which I thought was interesting. Uh, Daniel Gurevich, a French medical historian, wrote this article in The Lancet uh, in the year 1999, a special issue marking the, uh, the turn of the millennium. And she predicts that in the 21st century, there's going to be widespread replacement of physicians by healthcare technicians, and that Osler was the last maitre à penser for a noble-minded general medicine. In other words, Medicine is going to be badly balkanized, but also medicine will be increasingly uh, treated as a technology. Osler lived at sort of, a, a, and, and I was a beneficiary too, lived sort of what might be the golden age of medicine in which medicine became first among the professions. But I think that has changed. What do you see in this picture? Let me, uh, this is a, a popular image of the physician. Let me ask you uh, what you see here uh, for, for the students uh, in terms of what this picture, which you're probably familiar with, uh, says to you about, about medicine. Let's, uh, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. You can pass if you like, but uh, let's start at the, at the order that you signed on maybe. Uh, Renee, what do you see here? What does this picture have to say to you as a doctor? Well, I don't know. I think it's a patient that is very ill. It's like she fell, something fell off the hand and the, the doctor is observing to see what, what the reaction is or is concerned about the patient. I don't know. Uh, Kyla, I think you were the second to, to sign on. I think it looks like the doctor is being less proactive. Like it kind of looks like they're observing and standing by but maybe that's more for support reasons. Okay, he said he, it looks like he was, it's what now? Like he's sitting with a cup of tea and he, it doesn't look like he's actively trying to help the patient. So it looks more like he's observing <laughs> them. It looks more like he's observing them or like trying to be there for support rather than being more hands-on, I guess. This is actually supposed to be some 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 medicine that he's trying to give the child, I, I believe. <laughs> uh, uh, right, that's okay. It's not a it's not a test. Uh, let's see who came next. I think uh, Rikai. I think you were the next person to sign on. I think the doctor is observing the kid, and at the background maybe uh, he's that. I don't know. Yeah, Abby, what do you think? 
my thoughts were the exact same as Rakai. I was thinking of the child and possibly the father in the back, just observing the physician, consulting her. This is a famous painting called The Doctor by Sir Luke Files. It's a signature painting of the Tate, Tate Gallery in, in, in London, the old Tate. Sir Henry Tate commissioned the painting. Uh, the doctor is uh, observing a, a very sick child. This is an iconic picture of the doctor. The image of the compassionate doctor is supposedly has stayed up all night. I love to look at this picture to see what you see. One thing I've talked to generations of medical students about this painting is the spine, doctor's spine angle. Notice how he's leaning forward. Your spine angle should be less than 90 degrees. Uh, instead of upright, and you certainly don't want to have your hands like that. Great body language. Uh, and when you look at his spine angle, as you start to study the painting, it's, it's parallel by the angle of that green lampshade, by the angle of the bed here, and by other angles in the room, and including the angles of this beam on the wall. Uh, the child probably has something like streptococcal uh, septicemia. Uh, the, it's a poor fisherman's cottage. The father is trying to console the wife. You've got the interplay of dawn breaking through the, the window with the light uh, shown here, the doctor with his medicines. Uh, it's a picture that, that actually the American Medical Association used this picture to try to forestall Medicare, uh, the old classic nostalgic image of the doctor. Uh, but let me ask you this, would you rather have this obviously concerned doctor or the gruffest, meanest doctor alive on the planet today who's got two grams of ceftriaxone, we call vitamin R, to cure the child of, of her streptococcal septicemia. Which would you rather have? Well, some, some pictures of, of this, uh, but uh, it's sort of unrealistic, et cetera, et cetera. But in brief, uh, the learning professions were classically the law, medicine, and ministry. These happen to be the topics taught in medieval universities. When, when I've contemplated these, these uh, three professions, a common characteristic is they perform services in rendering judgments in matters of importance in which there's a lot of uncertainty about the outcome. And that's why learned men, doctors, lawyers, and, and, uh, and, and, and ministers of clergy help people through very difficult times in their lives and uh, are valued by society for that. But what's the rub for medicine there? Well, the rub for medicine is that medicine being wedded as it is to science and technology inevitably moves forward, reducing the amount of uncertainty. Uh, you look at the two pillars of medicine, competence and caring. I assume that all of you Kyla hasn't yet a, applied to medical school, but the rest of you probably, unless you're really an outlier, told the admissions committee during your interview some permutation of the idea when they asked why you wanted to be a doctor. I like science and I want to help people, right? I like science and I want to help people. Well, uh, we've got uh, the, uh, for, for, for competence, liking science, emotionally detached concern for caring, wanting to help people, empathic care, and I've looked at this in varying degrees. I looked at it in terms of my own reflections as an infectious diseases specialist when AIDS hit. At first, uh, when we, we saw the first cases in 1981, we had nothing to offer except for that bedside caring of the doctor shown in Luke Fielders' Phil, painting. We, so we found ourselves making house calls, hugging patients, listening for long uh, hours on end, uh, really down there with our patients sharing their pain. Ultimately, only about 15 years later, highly active antiretroviral drugs came out. The patients no, no longer needed that. We went from a caring-based work ethic to a competence-based work ethic. And so I thought about medicine and I've looked at professionalism in medicine as being a, 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 as being a tiered construct rather than a monolithic construct. This, this was my thoughts on the subject at a time when people were trying to define what we mean by professionalism. And I define basic professionalism as simply doing the right thing well. Higher professionalism is service that clearly transcends self-interest. That doctor in files is painting, staying up all night. Me, for example, on a Sunday afternoon, I would have to decide during the early years of the AIDS epidemic, 
whether to play nine holes of golf or watch a pro football game on television, or maybe drive 30 miles into, to, out into a small uh, outlying community to see someone dying of AIDS that I would probably uh, never see again. So this is what I would call a calling, this idea of higher professionalism that is virtue-based. Uh, and uh, uh, But unfortunately, uh, some of the forces that oppose professionalism include the loss of autonomy. The, uh, it used to be that doctors, the second row here, uh, that doctors such as Osler were learning because they had, they, they, they had libraries, they bought books, they read all the time. Uh, and uh, Osler, for example, prided himself on his library, which is why you have the wonderful Osler Library at McGill. The digital revolution has, has made it so that anybody can access this information. The moral authority of the doctor has been eroded by the uh, patient's autonomy movement and ethics. The esoteric expertise has been eroded by commodification. Individual freedom has been eroded by clauses and contracts. Your situation in Canada is, of course, different from ours in the United States. And a lot of people find the joy of practice is less. A Canadian nun named Walla uh, 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 Kenny gave a wonderful lecture to the Oster Society about a decade ago, and she identified four pivotal events in the evolution of the medical profession. These were, first, the Hippocratic tradition in classical Greece, in which uh, famously, uh, as we, it has come down to us, Hippocrates, actually a rather mythical figure, uh, separated medicine out from religion and, ma and magic, is insisted on objectivity. Second, the invention of the medical, uh, of medical ethics and hence the medical profession, which took place in post-Enlightenment Great Britain, John Gregory and Thomas Percival. Finally, a, a third in 1910, the Flexner Report, uh, a survey of North American medical schools in which a few schools like McGill and, and Harvard and Hopkins were taken as a model and all the rest fell short of the idea of a learned research-based medical school but finally, the commodification and commercialization of medicine, which is taking place uh, right now. And Kenny asked whether it is even possible to be a professional in uh, this uh, environment. Capitulation, I'm looking at the bottom, capitulation to a consumer-driven business model with the potential to eliminate the very possibility of professionalism. And as medicine becomes increasingly commodified, and with uh, hospitals being uh, having uh, ownership of doctors and the hospitals in turn being uh, owned by conglomerates. I, I've uh, come up with something that I call Brian's Law of Professionalism, which defines professionalism as being inversely related to the degrees of separation between the provider and the client. In other words, the classic doctor-patient uh, relationship defined professionalism, but now, at least in the United States, and I would assume in, in Canada, you have so many layers of people coming between the doctor and the patient that it makes it difficult. Usler saw medicine as being a sort of guild or brotherhood. Any member could take up a calling any place in the world and find people with the same language. He saw medicine as being a calling in which race, creed, nationality didn't matter. Uh, he saw medicine uh, mythically to be sure and, and, and physicians as being like an apostolic succession dating back uh, to Hippocrates. I think it will get back around to this a little bit later. And to me, uh, membership and participation in the American Osler Society uh, was shown here with, with members of the Osler Club of London and the uh, Osler uh, Club of Japan at the far left uh, at the Royal College of Physicians of London in 1994, uh, here in Edinburgh in 2003, that's me uh, reciting Burns's address to the Haggis, here in Boston in the Ether Dome in 2004. Uh, the idea of a brotherhood of physicians or a brotherhood slant sisterhood of physicians, a worldwide community of physicians, to be able to think of yourself as a cohort. And do we have that anymore? Well, I'm afraid we're losing it. And uh, that's one thing that I'll come back to toward the end because medicine's become so balkanized so that your allegiances will be become 
and toward those uh, during, doing neuroscience or pediatrics, or perhaps to bring uh, Kyla in uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, your allegiance has become uh, balkanized away from this common idea that I think we need to recapture. And Osler, as he, as he grew older in his, uh, his, his uh, London uh, period, his Oxford period, became increasingly philosophically philosophical. And uh, at the time of his death, he was seeing uh, in terms of the new humanism being developed by George Sarton, a young Belgian who uh, immigrated to uh, Boston, to Harvard, who was uh, developing this, the idea of a new humanism that was science-based. The idea, in part, that the humanities had largely uh, uh, failed us to some extent, and that the core values of the humanities needed to be brought to bear uh, on uh, science. That excite was a, a subject of great excitement to Osler at the time of his death. Osler, in his last address, in the last paragraph that he ever had published during his lifetime, talk, uh, paraphrased the Hippocratic Oath, or one of the Hippocratic Hippocratic maxims, uh, uh, more properly said, about uh, to the effect that where there is love of humanity, there also is love of the art, or the art of medicine. He, he characterized that as philanthropia, or love of humanity, a philotechnia, or love of science and technology, and philosophia, or love of wisdom, the idea that this is a, the triad for uh, for really saving uh, humanity from ourselves, we might say. Finally, Osler on the big questions of our existence. In 1904, Osler was asked to give the Ingersoll lectures at Harvard on the science or the subject of science and immortality. He realized that he had nothing really uh, fresh to say about that subject. Who does have anything fresh to say about that subject? Because on the issue of immortality, no one uh, really knows for sure. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice that I've seen is that in the whole history of, of the world, there have been four basic ideas, uh, uh, immortality and, and resurrection of the soul, whether without uh, the body, uh, reincarnation, uh, vanishing into nothingness or some sort of metaphysical fusion with the universe. And the author's advice was, you know, pick one, and then get on with your life because it's really an unanswerable question. But I look at Osler as really getting in his uh, faith. He was, uh, his father was a man of the cloth. He toyed with the idea of being a clergyman himself. He sort of drifted away from the uh, dogmatic uh, Anglican uh, faith of his, uh, of his upbringing. But I think he came very close to the idea that, that I learned from the, the, the Protestant theologian, Paul Tillich, which is, and this is sort of a personal credo, that belief and faith are not the same thing, that faith involves holding belief and doubt in a state of dynamic tension. Take the attitude of Socrates that you know nothing for sure. Be skeptical. That's the way that all of you approach laboratory science, and I think that's the way that we should approach a lot of the big uh, questions too. But you do have faith, which is a, a, a state of picking your, the, the, the best thing that you, you find out there in the arena of belief while not being dogmatic about it, not being uh, uh, of a bent to fight somebody about it, and then acting upon it because you have to think that something is the best course of action in order to act. When you prescribe a drug, for example, you have to have confidence that this is the best thing for your patient, even though you have reservations about it. You know that laundry list of, of side effects and similarly, uh, the patient has to have, have faith or trust in you uh, that you're doing the best you can, realizing that you're a mortal human being. But I think the, 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 the issue that concerns me now as I'm uh, nearing my uh, 80th year or nearing my 80th birthday, I'm in my 80th year and thinking about today in the context of global warming and the other dangers out there, is that you young people are really going to have to live in the Anthropocene era and the consequences of it and the global, the effects of global warming and all the other threats, including uh, nuclear uh, warfare, uh, in, including uh, 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 pandemic uh, diseases, uh, a, a whole host of things, cyber intelligence uh, going awry, et cetera. 
And I think of just how, how wonderful it is to be alive now. You are here, uh, but uh, which is really quite remarkable. And, but all of a sudden, uh, we have been able to, to, to figure out the physical universe to the extent that we've got it down to, to quarks and leptons and the uh, biologic universe to the, to the extent that we're able to clone and, and edit DNA. But we're really at, at, on the precipice of, of losing it. And uh, uh, Osler was philosophical as he mused over these questions in the wake of great war. He lost his, his only uh, surviving son. He had a, an infant who died at six weeks, but Revere, the apple of his eye, was killed by an artillery shell in Flanders in 1917. And so he became increasingly philosophical. And in that last address, he made this rather striking statement. There must be a very different civilization or there will be no civilization at all. He made this, uh, and, and today I think this really resonates with me. This is a book published by McGill Queens University Press by Canadian philosophy philosopher on the democracy of suffering, the need for a new philosopher, a new philosophy as we're living on the edge of a catastrophe, that we really need a paradigm shift in our, our thinking, uh, colossal new ways of our shifting. I wonder, for example, whether all of medical ethics that was stressed in my uh, generation, and one of my hats after serving as the chair of a department of medicine was to be director of a center for bioethics and medical humanities, but all the ethics it was, as it was based, as you know, on, on patient autonomy. The four principles, uh, as expressed by Beecham and Childress, of modern biomedical ethics uh, being beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, and autonomy, with autonomy having a uh, primacy. But it turns out that the term bioethics was coined in two opposite senses in, in the year 1970. One sense was this idea of bringing moral philosophy to bear on the problems of clinical medicine, but a second sense coined by a, 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 an oncologist scientist at the, uh, at the University of Wisconsin named Van Rensselaer Potter was that bioethics is a science of human survival in which biologic facts need to be taken into account. So I think there's a lot of serious thinking to be done. And one reason, again, that Osler matters to me is that he had wrote such a uh, left us such a rich legacy of essays. He was sort of like the the Ralph Waldo Emerson of, of medicine, and in such e essays as science of, of uh, and and, uh, and and mortality, man's redemption of man, and the old sciences, the new humanities, he expresses in terms that mesh the humanities with science uh, that apply to the big questions and make us think. Uh, so getting back to this idea of myth, uh, Patrick Fittes talks about the myth of William Osler. Why not? Myth is very useful. This is a slide I made from a book by Naval, uh, uh, Yuval, uh, Naval Harari, in which he talks about the idea that 70,000 years ago, uh, we developed the capacity for fictive language and that basically, all human activity, uh, collaborative activity, is based on the idea of myth. As, a, as an individual, uh, the myth of the universal hero, which is exemplified to me by Osler, the modern myth of the universal hero, the, the common storyline of, of all fairy tales, is that someone is called to adventure, goes into an unknown realm, finds various mentors, has various challenges, faces a supreme ordeal, and if prevailing, if successfully slaying the dragon, brings back to the previous world an elixir that's restorative. And so the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Osler myth is indeed a useful myth in these two, two respects. One, what he means for me personally in terms of the examples of his life, uh, a, a credo of, of work, a credo of service to one's fellow human, and also the myth of the medical profession, which might be able to make a difference. He says it linked together by strong bonds of community of interest. The profession of medicine forms a remarkable world unit and the progressive evolution of which there's fuller hope for humanity than in any other direction. And so I would like to, uh, to, to end on that note and summarize in an article that Scott Podolsky and I had in the New England Journal of Medicine 
uh, in December uh, 2019, the idea that if we could just somehow get the worldwide uh, community of healthcare workers, of people who think about health, who think about medicine, who think about science and technology as applied to medicine, who think about the social economy of the healthcare enterprise, if we could get everyone together and, and, uh, and be a force that would oppose all the forces of selfishness, of greed, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that threaten our fragile planet and, and threaten to bring us to the end of destruction. I'd like to leave with this uh, point. This is from the wonderful Osler Niche of the Osler Library at McGill, uh, the, the picture here. But uh, uh, one of Osler's favorite aphorisms to me is the idea that spend the last half hour of the day in communion with the saints of humanity. 